You are listening to Episode 70, Understanding the Aftermath of Shame. Welcome to Play Therapy Community Podcast, providing connection, information, and inspiration to child therapists all around the world. Here's your host, a licensed psychotherapist, a registered play therapist, and my mom, Jackie Flynn. It is important to know that this episode was recorded before COVID-19, so you may hear mention of opportunities no longer available. So today I had the opportunity to support Dr. Andrew Dobo. He's a local EMDR clinician. Um, I supported him as a consultant with his local EMDR basic training here in Central Florida, just helping him out with the training process and being there for the trainees um, as a support for him. People flew in all over for his training. I seen people from Oklahoma, somebody from South Carolina. There were people that drove in from Fort Myers, Fort Lauderdale, lots and lots of local people too. I love meeting them. They're a great group. So I do have to admit that meeting the students and working with the students is absolutely one of my favorite parts. I love the EMDR as well, but just seeing the clinicians eager to learn EMDR therapy is just is so inspirational and energizing. I do have to hold myself back from chatting their ears off as they ask me about how it works with kids because it's not necessarily something that um, feels like common sense to us. So it, it takes a little bit of um, navigating to work with kids. It, it does strike me as odd, I guess funny, how I just love to talk to people. Now I'm even speaking on this podcast, which if you roll back the years when I was in eighth grade, I would literally go days without saying even one word at school. I used to think of it as like painfully shy, but now that I'm a therapist and I know a lot of the Um, clinical terminology surrounding it. I recognize it as social anxiety symptoms and some parts of um, some symptoms of like adjustment disorder. Uh, We had just moved that year from Kentucky to Florida and oh my goodness, what a change it was. It all started with someone's innocent comment about my accent. It was actually someone saying, could you say that again? You sound so neat. Say it again. And instantly, I didn't even want to speak. I didn't even realize I had an accent until they mentioned it. And of course, as I think about it now, it was probably pretty different than what they were used to. So just like a tsunami of overwhelming feelings came over me and it was all part of just that moving from this little small town in eastern Kentucky that had I believe at that time and the school's not even there anymore less than 500 students in grades k through 12 it was the whole span kindergarten through 12th grade to this middle school here in Central Florida with only 7th and 8th graders that had just under 2,000 students. So it was a life shift for sure. I had a sense of shame. It was a sense of shame that internally it was created. I'm sure it was not malintent by anyone, but the comments and the overwhelm from the move All of that coupled together made me feel shameful about who I was and where I came from. I felt different. I felt like I didn't belong. Now, luckily, I went to high school that next year. High school changed things for me in a big way. I joined Junior ROTC and the rest is history. That was a program that was instrumental in my life as I um, went all the way through high school in it. I was the first female company commander in 11 years at that school. I felt a sense of confidence, a sense of belonging. I felt a sense of accomplishment. I felt good enough. I felt like I matter, which was really something that just drowned out that shame and um, it it made a huge change in my life. I went to training when I was a school counselor and one of the things I learned in the training is 
when you can engage a student in something that they like, whether it's band, whether it's junior ROTC, whether it's an art club or a journaling club or soccer or football or cheerleading, anything that sparks their interest, that child is much, much more likely to graduate from high school and be engaged and be passionate about coming. So JROTC was that for me. It stands for Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps. After high school, I went on to go into the United States Army. And through the um, Army, then I was able to earn college money and through the college experience I was able to become a school teacher school counselor and um, eventually a mental health therapist and um, lots of training since then I love training but the shame could have very easily held me back so today's episode is all about the magnitude of shame and how we can help our clients heal and grow after distressing and disturbing events the guest on today's show is somebody that I hold near and dear to my heart. Her name is Sandra Stanford. When I went through a personal issue, a divorce, a couple of years ago, she was there for me. And I experienced MDR therapy as a client. And I am here to tell you, it is amazing. My experience was a bit intense just because the actual life event that I was going through, the... Um, just the experience of the divorce was a lot. And she was right there for me, helped me move through it and heal through it. Um, when I say I love her as a human being, I love her as a therapist, I love her just as um, just a gift to the world. I, I, I truly mean it. So let's take a listen to my episode on shame with Sandra Stanford. This episode is brought to you by EMDR and Play Therapy Integration Support. Are you an EMDR trained therapist that works with children and teens? I'd love to help you integrate play therapy techniques throughout all eight phases so that your child and teen clients can fully experience the immense healing power of EMDR therapy. Visit JackieFlynnConsulting.com to check out my free webinars, EMDRIA approved courses, certification opportunities, case consultation options, individual and group, and much more. Children are not miniature adults, so working with them in a developmentally appropriate way can make a world of difference. Again, visit Jackie Flynn consulting.com. Hi, Sandra. Hey, Jackie. Thank you so much for being on the Play Therapy Community Podcast. Um, let me have you just introduce yourself, tell people who you are and what you do. All right, Jackie, I'm delighted to be on your program. Thank you so much for asking me to be a part of this wonderful community. Oh. I am a licensed mental health counselor. I found myself on this path when I was in my 50s. I decided to go back to school and never intended on becoming a counselor, but have really found a passion for working with people that I, I love. I just love this profession. I am certified in EMDR therapy, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And I love EMDR therapy. It helps so much with trauma and a one-time event or a series of events for someone, and it helps to heal them of different cognitions, different belief systems. Mm -hmm. I also work with couples, and I'm the founder of Our Marriage Matters and Retreats, mm -hmm. and really enjoy helping couples get healthier, either to heal from wounds or to just strengthen their marriages. And I have a, a niche with a fair healing and work with people to help them heal from affairs. I'm also certified with um, Brene Brown's organization called The Daring Way, and mm -hmm. she is a researcher on shame, and I found a niche there as well because in the counseling room, began to see how many people suffer with shame, and I wanted to get more knowledge on that, and so it has been a blessing to me to learn more about this area and to be able to help my clients. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, and that you do. I have to say, I was first drawn to you by like your amazing work in the EMDR community. But once I got to know you, like you do so much more, but even more importantly, you have such heart and soul and passion for what you do. Mm-hmm. And it, like you are helping people in so many realms, trauma. And then you mentioned like through a fair healing, which is not everybody's cup of tea. And, right. and you just jump in that, um, you know, full force and really making yeah. a difference in the community. When I seen your stuff that from the um, uh, Brene Brown, the shame and vulnerability it just really hits home. You know, there's a lot of lot of things that um, clients are struggling with that the main ingredient is <laughs> shame. Right. So I'm excited for that to be the topic of our discussion today. Yes, me too. Me too. So yeah, mm-hmm. I'm excited. Now, I know at the time of this recording, we're just getting ready to um, host or facilitate our first space to training of EMDR therapy. So uh, if anyone's listening and they're an EMDR trained therapist, Sandra and I have an amazing training. I can't wait. It's a day long training. Oh gosh, it's going to be amazing. We do like hands-on activities and shame and um, just really uh, help and prepare the client for the later phases of EMDR therapy is a big focus. Yes. Yes, it is. I'm really excited too, because phase two is such an important preparatory phase for helping the clients in the reprocessing phases. So I'm excited, Jackie. Yeah. And I know like we've talked about it a gazillion times. We host a, um, with, along with Suna Clinch or a local EMDR study group, but we talked about the importance of going to a training and actually experiencing um, what you're learning and being able to take what you've learned and apply it into practice. So that's something that we really kept in mind when we were designing this training. Right. That people would be able to go into the counseling room on Monday morning and use some of the tools that we give them on, on Friday. Yes. Yeah. I'm excited. I think if we weren't given this training, I'd definitely be signing up for it. (laughs) I would too. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So let's jump right in. I know there are three big areas that we're going to cover in this um, discussion. And the first one, just really looking at healthy shame and how it begins in childhood, describing the effect of healthy attachment on disruption and repair of shameful events. The mm-hmm. second one, we're going to define and identify the physiolog- uh, the physiology of shame. Right. And being able to just look at the difference between shame, guilt, humiliation, and embarrassment. Those are like three, I think sometimes people use them interchangeably, but they right. do have distinctions. And the, you know, you're going to talk all about shame shields and how we can yeah. protect ourselves from shame. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. The last one, looking at the therapist role in recognizing and healing shame. A lot of times people show up um, in the relationship with us with the same pain that they're experiencing in their life. So I'm excited about this conversation. I can't wait to learn from you, Sandra. Ah, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, let's dive into healthy shame. Because when we think of shame, we don't always consider an aspect that there is healthy shame. And it is an emotion that teaches us about our limits. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't go into a restaurant and step up on a table and sing the Star Spangled Banner, because that could cause some shame on us if we do Mm -hmm. that. And so it will keep us from that. Healthy shame is associated with kindness and consideration, and generosity. You think about passing an elderly person who's trying to load their groceries in the car and how you would feel if you walked by that person and didn't help them out. You Mm -hmm. would feel ashamed of yourself. So there is healthy shame. And the affect regulation and the repair of self that we find as children when we have a healthy attachment Mm -hmm. helps us in developing this healthy shame. I'd I'd like to give the example of my precious grandson if I can. Absolutely. He's so (laughs) cute. I love looking at the pictures of him on Facebook. He is adorable. His name is Ashton and our daughter is Annabeth and she's a really great mom. And Mm -hmm. he's 17 months old now, but when he was, it was a few months ago, I was over at their house and and at the ages of like 10 to 13 months, what you know about children is that they are just frequently 
positive at that age. They're full Mm -hmm. of energy. They're full of curiosity. Um, They're always moving. (laughs) Mm -hmm. They're they're in this high arousal state. And there's that state between him and Annabeth, that co-regulation state that mom and I are connected. Mom and I are in a good, a good Mm -hmm. uh, state with each other. It's associated with their autonomic nervous system. Yeah, it's kind of so, like a, a dance almost where they're they're just mm-hmm. kind of moving based on each other. Absolutely. That is absolutely what it is like. It's like a dance. And um, the day that I was over there that Ashton decided he was going to go over, he has two huge dogs. They're uh, Airedales, Sherlock and Weta. Mm-hmm. They have these really big bowls of food. And that day he decided he was going to walk over. His mom was on one side of the room. He was on the other. I was sitting on the couch. And he picked up that food and he started heading toward Annabeth with this big smile on his face. And as he's heading over to her, expecting her to mirror him, he's taking that food and he's starting to put it in his mouth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she turns and looks at him and she goes, no, like that. Cause she didn't want him eating the dog's food. Mm-hmm. Well, that look of no and disgust in a way that, that look that is not mirroring his look it causes him distress. Mm. There's distress there because, and there's a, a deflation of his posture. You know, when, when you see that look on your mom's face and it's, Oh no, don't, Oh no, don't eat that. Right. He can't auto regulate at that moment. And yeah. it shows up for him because of that look on his mom's face, because that tone of voice from his mom, he's anticipating a smile. Mm -hmm. As he approaches her, they've been disconnected because they're across the room. He's coming back across the room to reconnect with her. He's excited about this thing that he's found that he's going to, his curiosity, he's going to taste it. And his mom is not mirroring his demeanor. Yeah. So those mirror neurons are picking up on that. There's some kind of disconnect there. It makes me think of the still face experiment where the mother looks away and the little baby, uh, tries to get her attention and then goes mm-hmm. right into a state of dysregulation because it feels so overwhelming. It does. I show that, um, that video regularly to my clients mm. because just understanding that we need someone to mirror us, even as adults, yeah. we need someone to mirror what's going on with us. Mm. Well, what happens to Ashton neurologically is he begins to shut down just in seconds. This is Jackie, Jackie, this is all in a matter of seconds. Yeah. Um, you know, where his sympathetic nervous system will shut down, his parasympathetic will be aroused. Mm -hmm. And, and the example is like a car with standard transmission and he's moving forward and all of a sudden he's slammed into reverse. Mm. Right. And so I know. And so his experience of shame comes from an unfulfilled expectation. And that's from the research of a guy named uh, Wormser. And he was researching shame and he saw that unfulfilled expectation, that lack of mirroring by mom. And That's so he crazy. had, when I think about that, I think about like, that looks like disruption. It looks like the baby's crying. And sometimes yes. as parents, unknowingly, they may respond in frustration or maybe right. even raise their voice that right. makes it, I mean, it's, it just kind of increases. It makes it seem even worse for the kid. It really does. And I'll tell you what was beautiful about that day. And this, this is all about the repair Mm. that the moment Annabeth saw Ashton's distress repair began to happen in a timely fashion, in an effective fashion. She saw him crying. She saw that face, his expression of shock, like what in the world, his head goes down, you know, his body posture goes kind of limp. Mm -hmm. And she went right over to him because she's attuned to him. This is what healthy attachment does. She's attuned to him. And that language of her and him is produced in that autonomic nervous system between both parties. That's that dance that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. See, Annabeth is the regulator of Ashton's developing autonomic nervous system. Mm, She's like a co-regulator. She's... He's allowing herself, her energy to be what he needs to be able to function. Exactly. So you know what she did? She reached out for him. She picked him up. She held him. She started talking in a soothing voice saying, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to yell at you. You didn't know what you were doing. You know, that kind of thing. Because she's a very good mom and they have a secure attachment. 
And so, of course, That's Ashton and gives me like chills in my body. I mean, <laughs> right? hearing you say that, that feels like I am safe. I right. am loved. I am lovable. Right. I can trust. Oh my goodness. Right? That's the good stuff. That is the good stuff. And so, of course, Ashton immediately calmed down. He reconnected with his mom. They mirrored each other. You know, gaze is so important to toddlers. They need eye to eye contact, especially with mom, even though dads are important. There's something about that eye to eye contact with their mom. Mm-hmm. And here's the interesting thing what we know from research is that Ashton will not go to the dog food bowl again, or likely not to, even when Annabeth is not in the room. Mm-hmm but he also won't suffer any ill effects from that shame experience. It was so, healthy. Yes. He hasn't been traumatized by it. Um, and it's important to learn that that's what secure attachment looks and feels like. And so the difference between healthy shame is that there is an immediate repair for that child. Toxic shame comes from a parent who doesn't immediately repair the connection. Yeah, that's what Dr. Siegel talks about that in his book, Dan Siegel, in one of the books. I've read them all so much, it just kind of blends all together. Yeah. It says it's, you can come back and you can make a repair attempt with your child, and that's where the healthy piece is. I mean, yes. I'll throw all, uh, out it, but if it's not necessarily what you did, and this shows up in the child-parent relationship therapy um, model as well, it's not uh, everything about what happened, but it's what you did after you did what you did. So exactly. that being able to pull back and repair, and you said that she just kind of met him with compassion, yes. and, and just that connection, is it's healing. It is healing. And the interesting thing that I found in this, Jackie, is that since there was a timely repair, this in the end ends up helping the autonomic nervous system instead of damaging it. Mm. It helps it. If you don't have the repair, obviously you get the damage, but get this. The bottom line is unrepaired shame experiences are toxic to the brain. But this is what I found so interesting. And this is from Dr. Shore's research. Mm -hmm. It is better to have shame experiences and have them repaired than to not have shame experiences at all. Whoa. That's powerful. Say that one more time. All right. It is better to have shame experiences and have them repaired than to not have shame experiences at all. Mm. So I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. It's ama- it builds resilience somehow in the brain. Um, shame in and of itself is not bad. We, we have something inside us that is uh, able to feel shame. It's just wired into us neurobiologically. No, is that Alan Shore's, or Alan Shore, Dr. Shore? It is. It okay. is. I think it's S C H O R E is how you mm-hmm. spell his name. And he has a book on affect regulation. Mm-hmm. Um, he's wonderful. Brilliant. So, and just to hear that as a parent, it kind of, it helps set me free from feeling shame for sometimes shaming my children because yeah. I did always repair with them, but I thought, Oh my word. I can see that this helps them in the long run to have had that shame experience by my tone of voice, by a look of shock, by whatever, and then coming alongside and go, oh my word, hold on, let's let's talk about this. Let me hold you for a minute. And that helped them to be more resilient than if they had never been shamed at all. It's it fascinating. I think of like Ernest Hemingway's quote, um, the um the world breaks us all, but many are stronger in the broken places. Ooh. You know, I broke my leg once when I was in the army in that place where it broke. It's not going to break there again it, because right. it right. grew back even stronger. It's kind of like Gorilla Glue. It may look a little messy and there's definitely <laughs> awareness that it happened, mm-hmm. but it's stronger where that happened. I wonder if that's kind of like the same concept, like it, it is hard. But when you can make that repair, then right. then it's it's Just solid. Makes, it does it 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 does in a strong way. And and for clients who grew up in homes that shames you every time you show an emotion, mm. you get shamed when you have anger. You get shamed when you have sadness. You know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, or big boys don't cry, or yeah. even I heard growing up, shame on you, right? Yeah, that's that, a phrase. 
if they were shamed, that's where some dissociation can come in and impairment come in because it's like someone is coming in and clipping that wire to their emotional state and they're numb. They just can't access it anymore. And many of us see traumatized clients that are caught in that I can't feel. And, and we help them to begin to feel again. We help them with disruption repair when, they, when we talk about shame and helping them to repair some of the shameful events that happened to them. So we play an, an important role in helping them to deal and reckon with shame. I think, Sandra, when you say that, I think about how, you know, we're both EMDR therapists and mm-hmm. just the, the magnitude of shame. When you unleash that, if they could not, if they um, had that cognition of it's not safe to show or feel my emotions, right? and then, we, it, but they're feeling all the disruptions from that and they come mm-hmm. to us for some type of healing and, and resolve to be able to move forward with the quality of life, right. but then they start to feel those emotions it may feel like a lot. And I love how EMDR therapy, right. um, the way that it's designed is to kind of take it out piece by piece and to be able to kind of um, only process through what the client can handle and to be able mm-hmm. to ground and, and to desensitize some of that right. big emotional distress that can come out with such situations. Absolutely. So, it, because if they could, if it wasn't safe to show their emotions or feel their emotions, many of our clients may be experiencing that for the first time right there in our presence. For the first time in a long time, because they were so shamed for doing it. So absolutely. And, and our presence is a therapeutic help for them. Like that is part of the therapy is how we present with them in session and help them through and being being a safe, calm place for them. So that's the you know that's the relationship. That's the very most important. I think there's yeah. so many great techniques and so many different right. types of therapies, but at the very core, what's yeah. most healing is us. I love right. learning about like the polyvagal theory and how they yeah. are leaning in and letting them, and I got that phrase from you, by the way, the leaning in, but letting them know that we truly see them and yeah. work with them and we care, yeah. that in itself is the biggest. Increase. It's huge. Mm-hmm. It's huge. So, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the physiology of shame. Is that okay to move Absolutely. on to that? Yes. Yeah, because what, you know, what happens when a shameful event happens? What happens inside of our bodies, inside of our brain? And this is so important to teach our clients so that they can begin to pick up on the cues. Oh, this is, this is what shame looks and feels like. They may have felt that way for a long time and just thought it was part of who they are. Mm-hmm. So the, it starts in the brain and the brain is going to signal the adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. The adrenal glands will release cortisol. Now we know what cortisol is. It is the stress hormone. (laughs) So the first thing that happens when someone feels shame is the stress hormone is released. Mm. And you'll see it it feels horrible and their eyes will go down. Mm -hmm. They won't, uh, they will avoid direct gaze. Like they, and think about when you felt ashamed. I I had the same thing happen where your head goes down. You don't want to look at anybody. Oh um, yeah, you kind of you kind of just um, fold into yourself, almost like that primal fetal position. Like I, I just need to protect myself. That's a beautiful way to say it. Mm. You fold into yourself, right? Your cheeks might get red. Um, so much happening in the body, you know, your neck and your shoulders are going to go down. Your mouth can get dry because when anxiety shows up, uh, our stomach shuts down. Our brain tells us we're in danger. We don't digest our food anymore and our mouth gets dry. The arms might tingle. I mean, time will slow down. It will be like if you're falling down in front of people and it's shameful and you're falling in slow motion, Mm. your heart will just go 90 to nothing. Uh, which affects your arteries and your muscles are flooded with glucose. I mean, all that in a matter of seconds is what that happens. And the physiological expression of shame is universal that they found. And this is the research of Dr. Burgo, but they have found that it is identical in every single child until they learn how to control it 
or how to conceal it. Uh. <laughs> Until they learn that, it's identical in every child. But think about how we do learn to control it and conceal it. And of course, I'm going to talk about shame shields in a few so minutes. Regardless of like culture, socioeconomic status, parent yeah. education, right. none of that is like um, uh, like defining of how they respond at the, in those early yeah. stages. It's you none know, of it. It's the body's instinct of I'm. I am a bad person. I think about shame. Yes. I am a bad. I'm a bad person. person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And what happens when that stress hormone, the cortisol, is released in our brain? It takes the prefrontal cortex offline. Mm -hmm. Now, the prefrontal cortex is like the CEO of your brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it, it's it makes it has a crucial role in higher judgment. It has a crucial role in decision making and in discrimination, and it goes offline. And when it goes offline, then strong emotions show up, like fear can show up, anger, shame shows up. Yeah. And then the next thing that happens in your body is the limbic system gets affected. And the limbic system is the fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, and if you had a stopwatch, it's just a few seconds that all this happens. Mm -hmm. Now, one way that I help my clients get back online, can I share this with Absolutely. everyone? Because I love this. This come from, comes from Deb Dana's book on the polyvagal oh, theory. Oh, yeah. Literally, yeah. I was looking at that book yesterday. I get to see her in a couple of weeks at a conference. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to get her to Florida. So ask her if she would think about coming to Florida. Oh, I hope I get to talk to her. Be that like, would be oh, amazing. I'll be like, <laughs> we're just talking about you. <laughs> All right. But one thing I want you to do, and I want everybody listening to try this, because it mm -hmm. takes seconds and yet it affects you wonderfully. I want you to close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I want you to think about a friendly hand resting on your back. For me, that friendly hand is my husband. Mm. And I imagine him putting his hand on my back, guiding me through a crowd. For some people, it's their best friend. For some people, it's God. Mm -hmm. So I want you to think about that. And notice what happens in your body when you think about that friendly hand. Jackie, what happens for you when you think about that? Well, I think about and I um, kind of pictured his hand on me, but then I uh, my dog popped in my um mm -hmm. mine too. Yeah. And I felt like uh, like an awareness of my heart. Mm -hmm. And I didn't change my body posture, but I'm kind of thinking that that probably would I'd feel, you know, more able. I'm kind of in my head now. But what I did you know, personally I felt that that warmth in my heart. Right. It's like a softness came over me. Yes. And what that does is it puts your body and your brain back online. That CEO that just got shut down comes back online again. Mm -hmm. And I love it when my clients come in and say, I used the friendly hand on my back this week when I was feeling stressed or feeling you know, something shameful happened or something aggravating happened. I just took a moment and imagined that friendly hand on my back and I was able to calm myself down. So it's wow. a wonderful calming thing. And again, take seconds. You can be on your way to a meeting and you're going to give a big speech and you're nervous. Think about that friendly hand on your back and it just lines up your vagal nerve um, and puts you back in the social status of the vagal nerve. So oh, that's so beautiful. And it's it's free. It doesn't require any materials. And it's no. so very personalized. I think about how that ties into like Dr. Janet Courtney. She um, really works with um, like infant and toddler mental health. And she talks mm -hmm. about the power of touch. And that is like a visualization yes. a method to incorporate that power of touch of somebody that you know right. that you feel that from. <laughs> Who oh loves God. you. So yeah. incredible. Now, I guess one thing that's coming to my mind is, unfortunately, some of our clients, and it's very few, they may not have that person to visualize. So I'm thinking it probably wouldn't work with everybody, but it, the people that it does work with, it could be super profound. Absolutely. And sometimes we can have our clients think of a book character that they really admire or a TV, a TV show, a personality on a TV show that they feel 
comfortable with and so you, you can use their imagination that way but there are some mm -hmm. clients that it might not work with at all and that's comes in knowing your client um and helping yeah. them work that's that through and i know so. that came up in our emdr study group about what if someone doesn't have like healthy yeah. attachment figures and um right. And I have to say that I've heard this maybe, you know, I'm an EMDR consultant as well. So with some of my consultees, they use that, you know, they use the, well, think of somebody that in your, you know, your realm and yeah. Harry Potter figures come up quite a few times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not Miss Umbridge. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt yeah. she's on anybody's list. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Might be on the other side. But that, like, even just, it's amazing. I was doing that as you were walking, you walking us through the visualization. And I can yeah. kind of still feel his hand on my back. It's I know. Powerful. I know. When I think of David's hand on my back, my, my whole heart area and chest just feels warm and opens up. And it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. So, mm. oh, yeah. Your heart opens up, and I think about Sandra, like if you were growing up and you it wasn't safe to show or feel your emotions, here you are in the presence of a therapist that has some real capacity to help you, but yes. if your heart is closed up, then it's hard to get right. the help with different techniques and visualizations and things like that that helps their heart open up, then right. they can be... Um, they they have the capacity to truly heal. It's true. Oh my gosh, it's so good. It's powerful. Mm hmm. Yeah. Now there is a difference between like shame, guilt, humiliation, and embarrassment. Let's talk about that. Okay. Yes, because that can get mixed up in people's minds. Even clients will come in and say, "Oh my gosh, I I was felt shame this week." And as we talk about, it, I go, uh, "Actually, that was humiliation." Let's talk about the definition of humiliation. Uh -huh. um, but when we talk about shame, Brene Brown defines shame as an intensely painful feeling uh -huh. that we are unworthy of love and belonging. I mean, shame is a fear of abandonment. Oh, God. you're not going to love me. You're not going to include me. I'm not going to belong with you. And shame is the feeling of, I am a mistake Ooh. or there's something wrong with me. I'm a failure. It goes to the very core of who we are. I think Whereas it is like being on the cellular level. I think of like, it, it's like trying to, um, when you're working with it, it can seep in places that other emotions can't get to. It's very fluid oh, like that, very much it's, like toxic. It, and it shows up anytime, any day. That it just will show up in any situation. We had a, a situation at our house where I ordered some really expensive lights and my son in love was putting them up. And I ended up sending half of a box of those lights to the dump. Um, and my husband went back to retrieve it. Of course, the dump said, we can't give them back to you. And I went right to shame. I was shocked that I went so cl close, so quickly to, oh my gosh, I'm a failure. I can't believe I sent that expensive light to the dump. My husband was so wonderful. <laughs> He's like, honey, it's only money. It's okay. I'm here for you. I don't condemn you. And I've said, really? Thank you, God. I was so excited. But it shows up anytime, anywhere. That's for anyone. I do. No shame. I do. Now, let me ask you, Sandra, with that situation, and I have to say, I felt a level of disturbance in my body just thinking of you feeling that pain, which is yeah. amazing. You experienced that in the therapy setting as well. But what right. was the worst part of that whole situation? The worst part was when I realized when we went to the box that I thought had the parts in it and I realized that they weren't there and I had sent my husband to the dump. We're trying to get boxes out because we're doing a little bit of remodeling and I w couldn't wait to get the boxes out. And so I, I, in my mind, I rushed him to the dump. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that moment that I realized, oh no, there on their way to the dump. And when I called him, he said, no, I've already been. I'm on my way home. Oh, that was the hardest part. Cause then that was real to me that I'm going to need to buy another light because I, I needed 
to another light. Yeah. So it was tough. But his response to me when he got home was just like Annabeth's response to Ashton. Mm. Compassionate, and caring, empath empathic. Yes. And my son in love was the same way. And he got on the phone with the company. They gave me a 10% discount on the, on the new light, uh, which I appreciated uh, him going to bat for me there because I, I was just shaken by it. Yeah, your prefrontal cortex went offline. You couldn't function. Yeah, my, it went offline. Now, guilt would have said, I did something bad. Mm -hmm. Guilt would have said, oh, gosh, that was a really terrible thing I did. It's not my core. Shame is my core. Guilt, I tell my clients, it's merit versus being. Mm. So guilt is about those things I do or didn't do. And I feel bad about them. Mm -hmm. But shame is there is something wrong with me. There is just something Ooh, deeply I wrong with me. It. And I will tell you that men and women who can differentiate between shame and guilt have a higher level of shame resilience, which I believe is why I was able to have a higher level of shame resilience once I got out of the shame. Like it didn't take me that long because I was like, oh my gosh, I am shaming myself right now. What am Ooh, I doing? You became an observer. You were able to step out of it and look at it and see it for what it was. I was. And with the help of the people around me too, that helped a lot. Your support. And then let me tell you a little bit about humiliation. I love the definition of humiliation because humiliation, if someone belittles you in front of your friends or uh, Brene talks a lot about art and speech in high school and junior high, because that's where a lot of shame comes from, from uh, someone having a really terrible experience with an art teacher. And so if an art teacher says to you, you know, you need to find another profession. You are just like one of the worst artists I've ever seen. If you crumple up that art paper and kind of throw it inside your desk, you know, hide it in there, that's shame. You feel shamed in that. Um, but if you look at that teacher and think, what a jerk. Mm -hmm. And if you say to that teacher, <laughs> which wouldn't be that nice, but Brene gives this example. If you say to that teacher, well, if you were so good at art, wouldn't you be out there doing it instead of in here teaching it? Yeah, I to mean, be able to not take it on personally and mm -hmm. kind of see it for at a different angle. I don't deserve it. What you just said or did toward me, I don't deserve that. And that's what humiliation says. You know, I no, I'm not going to own that. I'm not going to own that I'm a terrible artist. I'm not going to own that you just said something to me that wasn't true. Uh-uh. No, back on you on that one. And that's mm -hmm. what humiliation is. Mm -hmm. And embarrassment is we know everybody does it. Like I think about EMDR sessions and it just seems like inevitably my stomach wants to growl because you know, <laughs> and I know that it's very quiet when, when the eye movements going or the pulsars I use are going. And I'm just like, really? Okay. I'm embarrassed in this moment. Or if you're sitting in a class at school and your stomach growls or you burp yeah. or something yeah. like that, you slip and fall in the parking lot and you look around, you know, somebody else, everybody else has slipped and fall, fallen or can't find their car. Yeah. So embarrassment yeah. is basically, look, we all know that we've done it. We're all in this together. And um, yeah, you can laugh at it. <laughs> yeah. I have to say the difference between children and adults, like I work with a lot of kids as a play therapist and you yes. see like even, you know, let, letting off gas. You see a little kid do it and yes. they sometimes they don't even mention it or they'll just giggle. Right. An adult does it and it will stop them in their tracks. They have to recover yes. emotionally. <laughs> They're like it's devastating to them. It's so true. It's like along the way, that embarrassment, you know, if we yeah. don't deal with it like in a healthy way, it can make it have right. an impact on our life. It sure can. <laughs> all, the, all, the, all the past gas, which all of us do. <laughs> which is a human bodily function. I mean, it it's is. not even like it's something that only applies to like a certain, certain anything. Everybody does. I know. <laughs> but it certainly could cause some shame, humiliation, <laughs> guilt, <laughs> and yeah. embarrassment. Or a so. good laugh and be like, whoops. <laughs> and, and there's the embarrassment. So that, that's the differences <laughs> between shame, guilt, humiliation and embarrassment. Mm. And, and I think it's important to know, because like I said, a client will come in feeling shame. And when you say I've shamed, that's deep. 
But if you turn and go, wait a minute, hold on, you respond in a way that shows you didn't own that, you were humiliated by that, or, oh, no, that's, you're feeling bad about what you did, but you're not feeling bad about who you are. That's guilt. And it helps lighten their load and to understand that. Absolutely. So a- to name it is to tame it. And when you can yes. put put it in, and I know that's hard to wrap your mind around, but when you can put some language to it, it lights up that left hemisphere of the brain while you're feeling it, which is lighting up that right hemisphere of your brain. It literally changes the architecture of your brain. It creates those uh, connections in your brain, and it it helps with the resilience. It does, and name it to tame it. I learned from you when I heard you speak one time, and I use it all the time with my clients. Because it mm-hmm. makes sense. <laughs> I use your stuff too. Sorry. I love that we're connected. Okay. Now we're almost out of time. We only have a few more minutes, but I do okay. want to make sure that we're able to touch on like the therapist role in recognizing shame and healing shame. So all right. I'm gonna do the quickie version of that. I will give you the quickie version of that. And uh, how I use that is when a client walks in with shame. There's a, there's a couple of ways I want to tackle this and I'm going to make it quick. We, if, if some, if a client says something, Oh, I'm a terrible person or I'm a failure. And if we as therapists sit there and nod or say, mm-hmm, you know, we got to make sure our minds aren't wandering as therapists that we're listening. The, the, th- the client will think we're agreeing with them. Mm. And so it's important for a therapist to say to a client, I can certainly understand why you might feel that way. Mm. but let's, can we look at it? Can we reframe it? Can we look at it from a different way? So you empathize with them that they're feeling that way. You don't want to put up the stop sign immediately because you want them to hear and experience your empathy. Yeah. But you don't want to have them stay there. Oh, that's so Um, good to connect and redirect. You're, you're approaching the right hemisphere with, I care about you. I see your pain. And then you're able to go that left hemisphere. However, let's look at this in a different way. Let's look at it in a different way. Another point on this is a therapist working with victims of you know trauma, clients with trauma, can actually cause a client to feel some shame by something that we say. Mm. You need to expect it. You need to expect that a client will feel shamed. And so it, you, you uh, address it. And I will say to a client, knowingly. yes, yes. And it's so almost say to a client, you know, I can tell by what just happened that that caused you to feel shame by what I just said. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. Or and it's important to call it out and not just try to yeah. distract yourself yeah. through it because that's our position, the elephant in the room. Something just happened. Let's yes. explore it. And that's, that Let's could be a version it. of the repair as well. Absolutely. You got it, Jackie. It is a version of the repair. And you can also take it a step further and say, what's the memory you have of this growing up? The way that you felt just now in the counseling room by what I said, mm-hmm. give me a memory from that. And so we can talk that through. Oh, and then yeah. that's good stuff. And, <laughs> and then the last point on that is that a client can shame a therapist. Mm-hmm. And I know at, at my uh, company, we charge for missed appointments. Like if there's a no show, or we have a 24 hour cancellation fee. And let's say a client came in upset with me. I can't, I can't believe you charged me for that missed appointment. Um, If I go into the, the dance with them. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, I won't charge you for today. Right. Or, Oh my gosh, let me look into that for you. Then I'm not helping them uncover the shame that caused them to come in and make that statement. See, it's not, it's not about the charge. It might be about their perfectionism. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed to miss an appointment. I'm not allowed to do that. We miss that opportunity to help with the very things that's kind of leaving them stuck in their life. Right. Because it can go into our stuff. So it's so important that when a client comes in or, or let's say they came in and said, Oh my gosh, I've, you can see I broke my arm this week and I ended up losing my job and I've got a huge bill from the ER and I've got, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, you know, as therapists, we are helpers. And many times our first response will be, well, I won't charge you for your sessions for a while. I'll make sure it gets, you know, taken care of. Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, you know what? Um, 
let's talk about the therapy. I can give you a discounted rate for five sessions and then we can reevaluate. Um, but let's talk about, you know, the crisis that just happened for you right now. So we can lean toward and help them, but we don't have to take on their situation and, and feel like we've got to do something to help them out when we, we don't, we've got to stay in, it's called the Cartman's triangle where we don't become a victim. They're victim by doing what uh, they would want us to do out of our feeling shame that we're charging them when they're having such a hard time in life. It's just important for us to stay integrated and to be able to say, yeah, here's where I can help, but here's my boundary for what I need as well. And it's important to stay, stay healthy in that. So Shane can show up. It's like a big um, representation, like a real life in the moment representation of what they're struggling with. So it's like a huge opportunity to get some good work done. And if we look at it from the other angle, it could, you know, like just kind of be not charging them or or whatever. It's just going to kind of keep them stuck in that pattern that they're suffering from. Right. Right. And, and that's where as professionals, we come in and try always go underneath, go underneath that statement that's happening instead of getting stuck right there on that statement, dig deeper and don't take that it personally. Them. And don't take it personally. Yeah, because that will help them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're almost out of time, but I do want people to know that you can find the show notes for this episode at uh, playtherapycommunity.com as well as a free download that Sandra is providing and um, you could find her um, links to her uh, Facebook profile and um, the marriage retreat that um, she runs good good stuff thank you so much Sandra you are amazing you know I love you on so many different levels like as a friend and as a colleague and just as a fellow human going out and doing good work in this world yes thank you Jackie for this opportunity it was an honor oh you're welcome you take care all right bye bye Uh Thanks for listening to the Play Therapy Community Podcast. Until next time, bye-bye!